We are joined by the incredibly talented Matt Smullen, the creative genius behind the award-winning short film, There's a Mobster Under My Bed, a dark comedy that made waves at film festivals around the globe. Matt's not just a filmmaker. He's the founder of Balloon Tree Productions, a full-service production company that's been crafting amazing content for over 13 years. His impressive body of work spans commercials, music videos, short films, and beyond. We dive into how Matt grew Balloon Tree from a one-man show to a thriving business, the challenges of scaling a creative company, and how he juggles being a dad with running his production empire. So whether you're passionate about filmmaking or entrepreneurship, this episode is packed with insights, laughs, and inspiration from one of the industry's most dynamic creators. I had a great time chatting with him, and I hope you learn a lot from our chat. Enjoy. I uh, am in a much different time zone than you, and uh, I this is a very calm part of the day for me. It is 9 p.m. Beautiful. In, in Tampa, <laughs> Florida. My two little ones are sleeping. Uh, Love it. It's a much calmer atmosphere than it, it usually is when I, when I record these. It's usually the middle of the day. I got the baby monitor in the corner of my eye. Yeah. <laughs> There's usually a lot going on. I work how from old home, are your, so. uh, How old are your kids? I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so I know exactly what, you, what you're feeling. Yeah, man. It's funny. I've done like four or five of these episodes now in this first season that I'm working on. And I always end up talking about family first. It's like become an, a theme. Totally. Uh, it's the, the human leveler. It's like everybody gets to relate to it. They understand through the human condition just what everybody else is going through. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's so much I want to talk to you about. First of all, thank you so much for giving me some time on your calendar. I really appreciate it. You seem no very busy. I thank you. was doing yeah. my due diligence. Uh, I love your YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I think I watched four of the videos today uh, okay. at different moments in the day, um, and I, I like I love all of it. The Die Hard one is definitely my favorite uh, <laughs> of what you have on your personal YouTube. I love Die Hard, and I also love that debate of whether or not yeah. it's a Christmas movie. I'm on board with you. I agree, <laughs> but also I like just getting a, getting people riled up a little bit around Christmas by forcing it upon people during Christmas. Yeah. So I get both sides. I, I can't play both sides, but I get both sides, you know? I'll let you in on a little, you know, peek behind the curtain is I actually think it is a Christmas movie, but I was like, it's a more fun stance to try and justify the other side of it. Knowing full well, it just gets under people's skin. And I don't know if you had a chance to look through the comments, but there was a lot of angry people in there. And it yeah, was just like so, mad. so much, so much fun. So much fun. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Well, okay. So I want to get ahead of myself here and start talking about your YouTube. I did want to start with family because I selfishly have been using this show this season. I recently read something about podcasting that said um, it, it's a saturated market, but what it's really great for is it's like a relationship accelerator. So yeah. I'm a huge camera nerd. I've been a camera nerd since I was like five years old. So I was like, you know, what can I do in my free time? Like a little passion project. It sounds like you like podcasting as well. And I was like, I'm going to find a way to just make an excuse to talk to creators that I think are awesome and just have interesting conversations. And if the only thing that comes from it is I make some cool friends, that's that'll be a success for me. Yeah, love that. Um, so first question, you have been doing Balloon Tree for 13 years. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. And you have a four-year-old. So selfishly, I want to know what are the big differences between pre and post children with your business? I mean, you had mm. many years to set it up and to get it kind of up on its legs and running on its own before you had kids, which was smart. But I'm just wondering, like, what are the things you've been learning in the last four years? 
What a, yeah, what a good question. Um, well, look, I guess it's probably useful to, to put into perspective when we had Tom, our, our eldest child. So <clears throat> we found out uh, Claire was pregnant in January 2020. And then literally a month later, it was like, we're in Melbourne in Australia, which was one of the most locked down cities in the world. Um, and so we got thrown into lockdown. I had a small team then of about three people. Um, and so everything I knew was like upended with, oh, I'm going to be a dad, this is awesome. I'm going to like set my family up and be the sole provider, you know, that dream. And then there was just this intense fear around what is business going to look like? So a lot of the, the challenges in that period was like, I wanted to be that kind of stable provider for, for my family in a world of complete and utter turmoil and, and uncertainty. Um, what it did do though is like throughout that that period of like it just really focuses you. You've got all of a sudden, I think going from a freelancer mindset or a sort of sole, small sole trader, maybe a small team, um, it's very easy to be kind of selfish with the way you do things and, and selfish in the sense of like I can work late, I can you know shoot interstate or overseas for a couple of days and there's nobody that's really relying on me to be back and kind of be a grounding force in whatever it is. You can just do whatever you want and kind of create the life you want to live. As soon as you bring in family or even a, a sort of bigger team, um, there's a lot more of that reliability falls on your shoulders and you have to be a, a reliable presence if you want to be around your family, if you want to be around, you know, to support your partner and then see your kids grow up, like you need to have that certainty. So I guess to kind of come back to your original question of like, how's my perception of business changed since having a kid? It's like, it's all about being able to consistently bring in revenue to support my family and the team here without having to stress or, you know, work all this extra time and then rob Peter to pay Paul. So I'm not seeing my family to keep the business afloat. I'd never want that to happen. Um, it also means that like I've got a team set up here where there's five of us and I can show up a little bit later because I drop the, the boys off at daycare in the morning and I leave a bit early to pick them up and have those couple of hours at night with them. Um, and that's built into the way my life and business is run because I know the team can support me either end of those days so I can go out and do those things without having to be tied to emails or on the phone answering queries. It's like, no, this is Matt being a dad right now and the team will support the rest of the business. So it really it really just focuses you and, and it becomes much more about other people and the sort of ecosystem you're in um, and it just drives every decision you make. It's like, can we build a really strong relationship that's going to continue to, to evolve rather than go, oh, this is a cool opportunity. I'll do a little freebie here or like a cheapie. It's like, no, all of this has got to serve the bigger purpose of financial stability, consistent work and relationships to then support everybody that's got to, you know, feed off the back of what the business is doing. Do your kids have cameras yet? Or will <laughs> they have cameras? No. They, I looked at absolutely. I, I remember years ago when I was doing a lot of um, production assisting on like TV commercials and stuff, there was a guy, he, he got really big because he shot all of the Wiggles DVDs back in the day. So he was like okay. the guy uh, and he had two kids and they were his camera assistants. So I'd seen them grow up from like 10 to 15 or so over the years. I'd sort of wow. worked pretty closely with them and they were just like just handling Aries and Reds like it was nothing. I was like, man, what a great idea to grow your own camera assistant. So look, yeah. if, if the boys grow up and they want to be a part of it, I think I'm all for it. But it's also like, I remember my childhood, my my parents were very much of that generation that were like, you need a, a solid backup job and like creativity. How does that pay the bills? Like my dad was, I was pretty clever and he was like trying to push me into being an engineer and stuff. And I'm like, no, I want to make art and do fun stuff. And mm -hmm. so I think with my kids, it's like, I'll never push them into something, but I'll absolutely, you know, if they start showing an interest in it. Yeah. Here's a little digital camera guys. Here's my phone. Take some photos and here's how you can frame it up. Like, is that interesting? And then if they, they are cool, we'll pursue it for sure. Did you know early that like this was, this was the path for you? You said art, creativity, you want to make things. Did you, yep. did you know that this was it? Not really. I, um, so I grew up in like a, a little country town outside of Melbourne and my school didn't offer media. It was just theatre and drama. And so that was kind of my like gateway into to performing and creating and stuff. Um, but I always gravitated towards the, the tech roles, so directing or behind the scenes and sort of running the, the sound and light boards and stuff. Um, 
And so when I, I went to uni, I just did an arts degree. It was like, I'm not really sure what my specialty was. Um, but, it, you know, at the same time, like every kind of filmmaker kid, it was like you'd always play around with a camera and make silly short films with your mates down the street. And, yeah, so I had that background. Um, and I think a lot of that kind of cinematic storytelling language I'd learned just by doing in osmosis through, you know, watching Edgar Wright films and Tarantino and like all of that stuff, you just like, you steep in it so long, you replicate it, you kind of learn the language that way. Um, mm. So yeah, when I started studying, I was doing, you know, some film uh, subjects, some uh, drama subjects and stuff. I was like, this film thing's really cool. And like, I'm learning all the theory behind it and how, you know, a wide shot into a mid shot into a close up, like brings you into that scene, tells a story and, you know, all of those kind of things that, we inherently knew because we'd grown up watching movies and TV, um, all of a sudden putting the theory on it, I was like, this is really cool. Yeah, I can kind of pursue this a bit more. And then through through some fortune, I got a job um, shooting real estate videos like while I was at, while I was at uni. So nice. a mate of mine, his sister started dating a guy who started a real estate video company and they're like, oh, we need a okay. guy to shoot auctions on the weekend. Do you want to come along? I know you're pretty handy with a camera. And so then had, you know, the study and theory side of it with like, oh, I'm learning how this works as a business. And then the two just kind of went, this makes a lot of sense. It's fun. Um, and just kind of fell into it that way. And so I never really like went, I want to be a business owner or a freelancer. It was just sort of like, I started working for this other company, had clearly the right skills and attitude. So I kind of kept getting pushed up there and, hey, do you want to production manage this thing? Oh, do you want to produce this and deal with the client? Here's a, a budget to produce something more interesting. Um, so when I graduated, I, I spent probably about a year there and then was just getting some little freelance gigs on the side. People saying, oh, you do all this video stuff. I need a conference shot or I need a whatever. So I started mm -hmm. freelancing and that got busy enough that I was like, cool, I'll quit my other job and just work for myself full time and then just see what happens. And so, you know, through natural, I guess, relationship building and, and um, impressing the right people, we've sort of built that relationships and those connections over time. And so now, yeah, it's been 13 years of just winging it <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, favorite Edgar Wright film? Well, I do can, love can you, Scott Pilgrim versus the yeah, world. Yeah, great, that's a good one. one. But honestly, like I think Hot Fuzz is one of those those brilliant films where it, it's I, I remember and I'll I'll butcher the the quote, but I remember him saying something about how like these kind of classic cop action movies are never made in like in England, let alone in this little rural town. And so I love the juxtaposition of that kind of quaint, tiny little town with like, you know, the suiting up action scenes and blowing people's heads off. Like it's such a cool, cool juxtaposition. And I think his, he, you know, there's probably a, a whole generation of, of filmmakers that have come up with like how you transition from one scene to another is like sort of three or four quick whip shots, punch in mm -hmm. sound effect things. Like that was, as soon as I went, we can do that. That's awesome like that just informed everything i did for like two or three years yeah it's so that's cool. awesome i can i can see a little bit of inspiration in your editing uh, on your some oh, yeah. of your youtube so there's some Edgar right in there a little bit totally yeah, totally yeah, yeah. yeah i love it I, <laughs> I i mean yeah i love those picks the obvious one Shaun of the dead i yeah uh, that one is, but uh, Scott Pilgrim, you know, I need to go back. I don't think I've seen that since it came out in theaters. Now that we're talking it, about it. It doesn't date poorly. And if anything, like the cast is well above its weight. Like it's all guys yeah. that was, you know, Chris Evans obviously went on to Captain America and stuff, but like Kieran McCulkin blew up through succession. Like there's some really amazing talent in that, in a like, he's arguably, in that. Oh my gosh. I'm, yeah, yeah he's, I he's to, Wallace. He's Gay roommate. That's it's the right. best. It's the best. That's right. Oh my gosh. I need to go back and watch that. Okay. Yeah. Let's back up for a second. I need <laughs> want to pick your brain about um you talked about, you know, kind of the context swishing of parenting work. Like yeah. uh I am notoriously terrible at context switching. I need like a decompression. Like it's really hard for me to like be dad inside. I have your, I'm coming to you from my home studio shed in my backyard. Um, yeah. it's really hard for me to just like put the, put the kids down, walk back out here and like need to be creative. And I'm like yeah. always trying to pick people's brains. Like I'm wondering if you have any tricks or any little bits of wisdom on what can really get you to flip that switch. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's the constant pull, right? Especially when your kids are so little, like they, there's routine up until the time you feel really comfortable with it, then it changes overnight. So mm -hmm. it is a really challenging period and, and thing to, to balance. I think for me, it's, it's just really clearly setting those time boundaries, right? And having a space, even if it is like just, you know, down the, the, 
garden path into the the shed, like a separation of space helps a lot. It's like if I'm in here, I'm in work mode. If I'm inside, I'm dad or partner or whatever. Um, and trying to be really diligent on your own discipline by holding those boundaries out. Um, I know I tend to do, like I said, in the mornings, I'm with the kids, we'll drop them off at daycare, I'll go to work, that's work time, then sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm out, home with the kids for a couple of hours, they're usually in bed by like 7.30 or so, and then I might do a bit of extra work just to kind of catch up on what I've missed through the day, but that one, that point is always a choice. It's never expected of me for myself, if that makes sense, Um, Mm -hmm. but my non-negotiables are I want to spend that couple of hours after the kids are home with them not thinking about work, and so... So um, there are days where, you know, there's heaps of projects going on, you're balancing all these sorts of things or lots of feedbacks coming in. Um, it, it's really tricky to sort of step away and but you're going to get the best of both worlds if you step away and are present with one thing or the other. So my kids are not going to have the best time if I'm home while sitting on the computer. Go, yeah, guys, just keep watching Finding Nemo. I'll get to you. It's like, no, they want dad there to play or sit and have dinner or read them a book to go to bed. Um and I know that, yeah, I can pick that stuff up later or have the team look after those things um, while I'm, I'm heading home. So it's just, it's self-discipline in a lot of ways and really kind of carving out the the space and time you need to do those things and then hold yourself accountable to it. Because, you know, like there's days I work from home and I've, I've got a little space in the garage too. Um, but even then those days are like, hey, Claire, which is my wife, I'm like, I'm in the garage working. Um please don't come in and disturb me. And then inside that there is flexibility. Like if there's an absolute meltdown or a kid needs to, you know, whatever, like of course break that boundary. But it's by setting that up and saying this is what it is, just because I'm here doesn't mean I'm here. It's when Mm -hmm. I'm inside the house with you guys, I'm home. Otherwise I'm at work. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And kids really respond to the structure that yeah. my kid, my kids do anyway. It's when life gets random or we're not on a schedule that they kind of freak out. They're like, "Wait, what?" Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so the, and it's the fun, schedule like, is big. You know, the, there's days where. Um, like the kids have been sick. And so Tom, who's, who's four, I brought him into the office a few times and it's like, Hey mate, like you're sick and I've got to do work. So this is a space now where dad's doing stuff. Like if I'm over here on a computer, you know, on a call, um, you can't come and interrupt and talk to me. And like, he's a kid, of course he will, but it's also trying Mm -hmm. to set that expectation and, and then knowing for yourself, like, all right, well, if this is what this is, rather than so, you know, keep him at arm's length and go, you cannot talk to me all day. Like he's in the office, we're going to get nothing done, but at least we've sort of set up this relationship where this is what's going on. So, you know, that day I, I took him in, we probably got an hour's worth of work done over the eight hours I was here. He had the best time because we're playing like there's the arcade machine. We went and got lunch. He sat on the couch and ate like McDonald's. It was just like the best day for him. But knowing that when I was over here trying to do work, I think it's going to build in, like you said, that routine or that expectation to be like, okay, well, this is what's happening over here. So I need to be doing this. Um, but it, it is hard. Like it's it's so challenging because I know when the kids were young, just trying to get anything done with any semblance of routine, you're like, you're up all night, you're not sleeping, you're tired. Like it's it's almost impossible to to manage well. But I think, yeah, if you can kind of have a North Star of like, I work from nine till five or 9.30 to four and then I'm with family either side of that and try and stick to that as close as possible, it's kind of worked pretty well for me so far. You're giving me a little bit of hope because I feel like you're a couple years ahead of me. My daughter yeah. just started school, the three-year-old. So yeah. I'm starting to see signs of like predictable routine and calendars, uh, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So balloon tree, 13 years. Uh, how many How many are you? Five of us. Yeah. The five, five full-timers? Yep. Yeah. Oh, awesome. That's really cool. And uh, break the team down for me. You have couple editors and admin, like what's the team like? Yeah. So it's myself who's creative director, producer for the most part. Um, I, I used to shoot and edit and do everything, but I'm very much off the tools these days. So kind of leading the team, business development, um, and any kind of creative direction. Uh, Chase, who's our production manager, so she's admin operations the day-to-day. Uh, 
and she's incredible, like a second brain essentially where a project will come in, I'll manage it into the, the system and go, hey, here's what it is, and then she'll just take it and run it for the rest of the uh, the project's duration. I'll check in, but she's, yeah, once it's in the, the door, it's it's all hers. Uh, we've got an in-house shooter, Ben, so he's our, our go-to DOP, uh, an editor, Rob, and then Majai, who we call uh, our content whiz. So he kind of does a bit of everything. It's bit editing, bit of uh, bit of shooting, bit of B-roll, bit of social media. Media is kind of a yeah one hat across or many hats across one person, um, and the aim for him is to kind of grow into being a second shooter more permanently as as we scale up, uh, or second editor depending on where the the workload lies. So it's really good. Like we we definitely use external crew as well, um, but the core team like for a lot of the jobs we can we can source internally, which which is a really cool uh, ability to be able to know that your expenses aren't going to move really each each That's fortnight. Really great. Um, but if you bring in a lot more work, it's sort of your expenses stay here and your your revenue can keep going up and it's yeah, yeah. it's a good little system. Do you do you still get to shoot any? Do you do you miss it if you're totally hands off the cameras now? Uh, you know what? Not really. And I, I think okay. like, I, love I the always, honesty. yeah, <laughs> I, I like, I, I think I was really good at recognizing I was never the best shooter or the best editor. Like I was, I was competent and if not good, but I was never great. And I never had, like, I'm not a gear nerd. I, I'm not sitting there seeing, you know, the new Sony camera where I'm going, Oh, it's got, you know, all this extra, mega bit. like it didn't really excite me. Um, and I also remember working with, you know, like Ben, I've known for 10 12 years now and he is just obsessed with gear and loves understanding all of the little you know the nuances of cameras and stuff and I'm like I don't care <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you um and so I like honestly the thing that really excites me is is the collaboration side of it so I think you know from early days making silly movies with my friends to today it's like you get to surround yourself with creative people who are real specialists in their own thing um who bring all of that that interest and excitement to that one skill set and i always describe my role or even like a director as the arbiter of taste where you're bringing everybody in and sort of yeah. going you've got all these different you know thoughts and opinions but you're the kind of pointy end that makes the the end decision or you you bring everybody onto the same page and go this is the direction we're going um and managing people's always got it's fraught with challenges, but I, I love the nuances of that. It's like, you know, we, we could be working together and you might respond really well to kind of direct blunt, you know, criticism or, or uh, feedback where somebody else might need a lot of that support and management and kind of, you know, bigging up. Um, to me, that's kind of the joy of it. Cause if you can see people's unique skill sets really sing and, and thrive in an environment that you can curate, I, it's so cool. And then you, you extend that over to clients where it's like, it, it is a cliche to say like, all oh, our clients are like friends and family, but they truly are. Like the good ones we've worked with for 10 years or so, like we love them. They're awesome people and we would happily catch up with them for a beer on the weekend or go and do some social event. But we just happen to be in a relationship where there's also money exchanged through what we offer from video production. And yeah. so I get to work with them and see what they're interested in and see them, you know, their roles grow inside the organizations they're working for because we can support them through what we do. That's the stuff that really excites me. So, you know, to kind of come back to the, do I miss it? I, I started the YouTube channel a couple of years ago as sort of a nice creative outlet. And I think the part I love the most about that is the, the expression, it's the writing or the, the idea, um, sharing of it rather than the actual production of it. And Ben hates me when I'm like, just throw the camera over there, we'll shoot it. And it's like, you know, shadows and whatever. And he's like, this, we can make this look better. I'm like, doesn't matter, dude, let's just do it. Like it, the, it's quick and dirty and messy and like kind of like that. It's YouTube. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I can pick up a camera. I have in the, you know, the last couple of years just for, you know, as a B cam or if we've got like a big multi-cam shoot or something, but uh, there are far better people at those roles than I am. And so I'd much prefer to support them in that and really give them the opportunity to thrive and then kind of be a part of that journey with them and, and whichever client we're working for. I think what might be helpful to know, I think a lot of people that are going to, at least my little community of people that I will share this, these season, this season with, is going from zero to one employee. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, I know a lot of freelance guys, solopreneurs, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's a big jump to go from zero to one. And I'm wondering, what did that take for you to go from, you're just your own operation to, okay, now I'm adding some people. Yeah. Um, it, it's a conversation I have a lot 
with a lot of different people. And um, I think the the first employee is always terrifying because it comes with a lot of that expectation of like, I need to keep paying them and I need to create job Mm -hmm. security for them. Um, But I think there's always that fear of like, is it the right time? And I think my attitude to this has definitely evolved, but I would I would always say that if you think that it's worth bringing somebody else in, don't think about what it costs you. Think about what it gives you. So, in most cases, a solo you know, business owner or, or videographer wanting to hire somebody, usually they're looking at an editor because it's the most time intensive, labor intensive thing um, yeah. that. You know, it also works better if you've got somebody that can just dedicate. I've got a day to work through all these rushes and build out an edit rather than you know, do an hour here, jump on a call next day. You know, continuity of time is really important for an editor too. Um, and so, when thinking about bringing somebody on like that, it's like, well, what would happen to you if you had eight hours or two or three days a week back? to do other stuff, not mm-hmm. just edit. And you can charge, you know, you pay your editor X, but you're charging the client Y, so there's margin on it. So you know that as long as you keep giving them work, you're making a return on on their, their cost to the business. Um, and when you start thinking about it that way, it's like, well, great, yeah, what an opportunity it is to then just sort of build out more capacity. Um, uh, so yeah, my my first hire was an editor, and it was it was a casual um, contract basis thing. But it was like his hourly rate was less than what we were charging the client, and so as long as those numbers matched up and we quoted the right way, you're always making money. And then it kind of it, it ticks you over into that. All right, well now I'm I'm not editing this thing. I've got a couple of extra days or whatever it is a week. What can I do? I'll go out and talk with new clients I'll prospect I'll I'll develop some marketing materials I'll you know do some self personal development like all of a sudden there's all these other opportunities for what you can do to to upskill or or improve the business and then all of a sudden the business starts growing and, and ballooning that way so thinking about it as far as a opportunity is is the way I I love looking at at hiring um but it is not to discount it can be incredibly scary because it is like you're taking everything from your brain and then starting to split that across multiple people or you might feel really uh, really across everything and then giving it to somebody else, that level of control has to be surrendered to some point that like what does that do to your product? A lot of us have built businesses off the back of ourselves and it's very – that identity is very much connected to the business. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to scale or in order to – build back a, a life where you have some semblance of control and, and time management to, to have kids or see a family, like you, you do ultimately need to start thinking about team if, if you're getting busy. So yeah, it's terrifying, but it's, it's some of the best decisions I've ever made because now I'm like, I'm in a position where there's, there's four other people that I can go, great, you guys run the ship. I can just step away for a couple of days or if, you know, God forbid something happens where you know, kids are sick or I end up in hospital, like the team can run things and I'm not sweating on my, they call it, um, uh, oh God, the word escapes me, but like the, the dependency on one person, it, it can cripple a business and yep. particularly when it's a small, you know, one or two person operation. Um, so if you can build out a team that can support that, then it's awesome and it just frees you up to do more and, and scale as you need to. Are you guys curious to know with your size team, what kind of low, like what's the cadence? Are you guys cranking through two clients a month or I'm just kind of curious, like roughly what can yeah. you handle with that size of a team? It's a great so, question. you get busy very fast. <laughs> yeah. It's a, and look, like any business, we have ups and downs and we're sort of, you know, sure. there's really, really busy periods. Um, I'll give you just top level. So we use project management software called Basecamp and that as soon yeah. as we get a job in, we'll just put it in there to keep track of it in conversation. Quick, just this is very rough numbers. We've got uh, five... 10, there's probably about 25, 30 projects on the go in various stages. So some of those will be in pre where it's just literally, hey, we've got this job, can we have a chat? It'll go in there, it's that early days. And some of them are like ready to be archived and backed up at our end. So inside that, an active project, there might be sort of 10 to 15 that we've like either got shoots or have just shot and are in, in post. Um, and that's pretty pretty common, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, we kind of get like every two or three months a big project and it might be like a sort of multi-level, you know, shoot, edit, lots of deliverables, like a really big kind of logistical um, project. But these ones are the pretty typical, like sort of half day, full day shoot, 
simple, whether it's a piece of camera and some overlay or three or four little deliverables off the back of it. And we, yeah, we're handling sort of 20 to 30 of those a month, which is, which is great. Like, again, it kind of talks back to that consistency element of it. It's like, we've got all these clients that we know, uh, are pretty good to come back most months because the cadence of their business, we just can support them on that. And so we know that there's always that sort of flow of, of projects. Um, inside that though, there's also like, I wouldn't say they're templated because it's probably the wrong way of saying it, but a lot of like similar, we've done projects like this in the past. So they are pretty easy to just to iterate on this year. So yeah. Yeah, we're doing a um, uh, couple of conference openers and a, uh, and a like recap year that was video. We've done the same thing for this company three years in a row. So there's a bit of a pattern and a um, consistency to the approach that just makes doing that easier. And so nice. we know that you know, September, October, that all falls in our lap because the conference is at the start of October. And so you can kind of forecast it a little bit as well if you've got those longer standing relationships. Um, but, you know, like that that's pretty pretty comfortable capacity. I'd say we could almost do more, to be honest with mm. you. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's probably just looking at it in raw numbers, like 20 to 30 projects at any one time is pretty daunting. But you know, every day you might have five or 10 of those moving in some direction at most. Um, right. And so it's just kind of having your centralized, you know, your your project manager um, or operations person managing all of the puzzle pieces of it. I'm filling right. the funnel with all of the new projects and then our post team and production team are just shooting it or delivering stuff. So it all kind of like of that, it gets segmented into the people that look after things as well. Got to stay organized. You know, 2025 yeah, exactly. is not a lot as long as you're organized. Yeah. Um, what Talk to me about the quoting process. Uh, mm-hmm. This is something that I've gone through different iterations of myself. Like, do I bend to what the big corporate client wants to do in terms of like payment and quoting process? Or do I say, okay, no, this is my process. This is my flow. This is how you buy services from me. Do you get what I'm getting at? I'm just kind yeah. of wondering like how you ingest new clients, basically, how you bill them, those kinds of things. Yeah, great. Um, we we force is the wrong word, but we definitely I- impose our uh, preferred method of working you have with to. us. You have yeah. to. And and one of the, the best things we ever did was build out a little working with balloon tree document and sort of like a six, seven pager, really good for like new to video clients in particular, but especially mm. a new, new client. Um, yeah. And it's basically like a little bit about who we are, how we quote, how we get a brief, how we invoice and a kind of glossary of terms is sort of the very top level. So that initial like how we, uh, how we quote, it's like we'll have a discussion, we'll talk about the wants, needs, the deliverables, then we'll send you an option or two to compare. Once you accept that, we invoice the first 50%, then on delivery, it's the second 50%. So like all of that is set up up front to really go, here's how we're going to manage this. Uh, and what it does is A, it sets the expectation from our end, but B, really makes the client feel safe. Like there's mm. there's process to this. There's a system. Right. There's an understanding of how this flow will work. But it also removes any of the like, hey, can we send the invoice now? It's like, no, you've, you've said, yes, this quote is accepted. It's like, bang, here's your invoice. There's no question about it. It's right. on final delivery. It's all approved. Bang, here's your invoice. Like it doesn't have to be that awkward all right hey is it done um all right we're just going to send our last you know, yeah 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 it just yeah. removes all of that um the same with like the glossary like i think there's it's very easy to get sucked into us talking in our jargon and being like dops and rushes and whatever and it's like a client who's never touched a video project in their life like what no is idea. a what is a rush like i don't understand yeah um yeah. it's just again like a really nice easy to look at thing where they feel safe it feels very exciting because it's it's creative and a bit hollywood like so all of that stuff just really sets that expectation and, and frames that relationship in your favor um but having said that, like some of the bigger clients we've worked with are these gargantuan, you know, international behemoths that go, we pay in 60 days and that's it. And yeah, you kind of go, yeah. yes, yes, no worries. We'll, we'll yeah, bend exactly. to your will. So you do pick <laughs> and choose your battle a little bit. Um, but for the most part, if you've got a really clear system and stages and, and how you manage a project, we've never run into any issues trying to establish that up front. Uh, it's always worked really well. Yeah, that's that's the way you got to do it. Are you? How much of that is base camp? That process from the ingest to yeah. So we we kind of have three main systems we use, and then there's sort of the the tangential attached to that stuff. So um, 
G Suite's kind of our main thing, emails, Google Drive, all of that sort of stuff. Um, Basecamp's our project management. So as soon as a project goes into, yes, this is of interest, we'll manage that through Basecamp. So we've got probably 10 different project types. So it might be like a shoot and an edit, uh, just an edit, TV commercial, podcast, live stream, like whatever as a templated to-do list um, yeah. and then inside that we can assign people through that so say hey we got an inquiry from Jacob he wants to do a you know 30 second highlight reel then we'll be like cool we'll make a little project in there and then it's like there's tasks for send quote is quote approved we confirm crew like all of it just gets managed through that and we can track it um, but yeah all of the like the quoting uh, is done through zero all our uh, like bookkeeping and invoicing and stuff through that Um and Notion is the big, the other one that we use as a third Love system. Notion. So Notion, we kind of treat, we could use it as a project management system, but we like the separation between Basecamp and, and Notion. Notion for us is like our internal systems wiki. So if there's anything that is to be repeated, uh, it's documented in there. So say we hired somebody tomorrow, the first thing would be, here's the Notion login for you. Look through all of this documentation. And it's stuff like how we create a new job in Basecamp, how the naming system, how we input, you know, crew details onto the thing. Like just everything is documented there. So you can scale it up really easily. Um, I've talked about this a lot of times with a lot of other production companies looking to kind of grow. And it, they kind of get to this point. They go, "Do we do we need to like systemize everything?" And I'm like, eventually, it would be helpful. But it's at the early stage. It's like all the stuff that you're getting out of your own head and getting somebody else to do, document it to be able to right. scale it. Because I think like you know we run pretty successful businesses if it's just ourselves because we can remember everything and we care about everything more than anybody else that will work in our business ever. But as soon as you start bringing in other team, like you bring in an editor, what's the what's the file management system? How do you name projects? Where do you post them to send to a client? What happens when a project's wrapped up? How do you archive the stuff? Like all of those things, you can have a conversation, but if you start bringing in 10 editors, like you're wanting that thing to be consistent, so document it and so you can repeat it. Um, so yeah, Basecamp is like, we, we spend 90% of our day in that and it's just kind of, for anybody who doesn't know, it's like a combination of Slack and Asana where we really gravitated towards it because inside the project you can have a, they call it a campfire, but like a just Slack channel inside the project. So if I go, mm. hey, Jacob, we're going to get you on this project here. Here's all of the information. You know inside that little bubble, every piece of communication has been documented in there. So you can go back That's and follow really nice. it. You can look at um, links and feedback. You can look at the task list. Like it's it's awesome. And it just means that as we're managing the 20 or 30 projects a month, we do uh, what's called a tree climb in the morning, which I love a pun. And we climb to the top of the tree for 20 minutes, look at what everything everybody's doing and then climb back down the tree to do our job. And in the climb, we'll just run through every job on the list and be like, this one, yep, that's going to shoot in two weeks. Great. This one, yep, we're in post. Oh, where's that edit at? Yep, you're going to get it out three o'clock today. Awesome. So it's that kind of quick top level look at everything. And then all of the deep work happens inside the project that we're working on. So it's a very, very quick run through how we kind of manage yeah, everything. Yeah, no, that's, but, that's, that's yeah. great. What is your philosophy on renting versus owning gear? Uh, own it? <laughs> I, 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 well, my philosophy is like I think if you can own it, great, because then you know that you're always going to make money back on it. I think right. renting it makes sense when it's like a really high-end piece of equipment. Um, so an RE or a RED or something like that, if you're shooting okay. a commercial, hire that you know, kit for, for the couple of days you're shooting or whatever. Uh, unless all you do is shoot TV commercials, then maybe it makes sense to kind of move that way. But I'll be honest with you, we still shoot on an FS5, which is what, 10 Great years camera. old? Great camera. Fant fantastic camera. But we don't need anything else. Like it, it's, it does the job for what we need it to do. Um, and we will upgrade at some point, and but there's just there's absolutely no need to it. And we could hire stuff on projects, and we have in the past where we need more kit. But our basic, you know, simple kits and FS5, couple of couple of aperture lights, and some audio equipment, and that gets us through most of the most of the work. And so we know that again, there's uh, inside of our rates for you know, sending a shooter out. There's gear included in that, that if we did have to bring on a freelancer and hire gear, for example, uh, we've got the buffer in the thing to to maximize that. 
but it's also knowing we own the gear and we don't have to account for renting stuff. Um, we can, if needed, reduce the cost because we've kind of already paid off the camera and all our gears our own. So th- that gives you some flexibility in that. And I think um, where it's really helpful is like, you know, we've got clients we've worked with for 10 plus years. And so they know what we charge. It's pretty consistent across the board, but they might come to us one day and go, hey, we really need to do this project. We've only got this tiny little budget. Can you help us out? We know we can because it serves that relationship and the, the margins on everything are, are as such that we don't need to cover all these external costs to do these things. We can kind of wear a little bit of labor cost in that. Yeah. Um, so I think the other thing around like owning or, or renting gear is if you can do it in a way like a, a pay to a rent to own or like a, a you know, lease or something like that to help with cash flow is always helpful. Um, mm-hmm. But it really depends on on the kind of gear as well. So if you like, say you're going to buy a I don't know an FX six or something, and you know that you will use it, and but you don't have the the ten fifteen grand to get a full sort of kitted out thing um, day one. See if you can get it on a business loan for two years and pay it off incrementally, which you might pay a bit more interest, but you then have access to the thing, you'll own it by the end of the year, and you know it's going to be that workhorse for a couple of years. Um, whereas, you know, if you're renting a from a rental house every time, uh, you're never going to be able to make that margin back, if that makes sense. You're always going to have to charge that to the client. Yeah. And so it's sort of forecasting the kind of work you're doing, the kind of equipment you know you're going to use really regularly. For us, it's a, a Sony workhorse, FS5, FX6, whatever it is. Um, it wouldn't make any sense for us to buy anything more intense than that because we just don't have the regularity on that. And the jobs mm-hmm. that we do need something for that, the budgets are as such that you can rent stuff in. So does that answer your question? I, it does. I have a... 1K tungsten softbox kit, like a mm. Chimera softbox that is like 12 years old and it's still my most used light. I just right. buy new light bulbs for it. It's just like the <laughs> go to. It's, I just need some negative fill in that softbox and I can just do all my corporate creation. Right. Um, Must run pretty hot though, I imagine. It gets a little warm, but I'm just cheap, and I don't want to buy anything like the aperture thing. Is there? Those those lights are incredible. I just, yeah. uh, I just can't. I, I think it's emotional at this point. Like I just look yeah. at that light, and I'm like, we've just been through so much together. I've taken you on shoots in different countries. Like I just, I've, <laughs> I feel an emotional attachment to it, and I just like, I don't know. I should. I I'm the same. It gets with a little, we've- It gets a little hot. We've got a uh, a 5D Mark II banging around, which is like oh, so beautiful. long in the tooth. But I'm just like, I can't get rid of it. Like it's just there's so much sentimental value attached mm-hmm. to it. That I'm like, I remember when we shot this really lo-fi thing we charged no money for, but we did it back in the day. And yeah, you got to hang on to that stuff sometimes. Oh man, you're pre, I'm the biggest, you can see behind me, I'm the biggest pack rat when it comes to cameras. <laughs> I have like so many things that I don't need that I will never, ever use again. But yeah. you're- probably as a better approach with your kids. I'm, I'm not pushing cameras on my kids, but like, I'll just take like an old beat up film camera yeah. and just let them just go to town with it. Like, here's a hammer, take it apart, do whatever you yeah, want. Fun. Uh, cause I have too many junk cameras that my wife wants me to, <laughs> to get rid of. Uh, They're toys now, honey. They're toys. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me just, I just want to look. Oh, I hope you don't mind me asking you this because I'm a fan, but I think you do have a Dr. Seuss tattoo. I do, yeah. It's uh, in, hang on, how am I? How am I doing? It's uh, yeah, Sam. I am from Green Eggs and Ham. Yeah, yeah, I had to ask you: Is it just you like that story? Any significance? Is there a cool story, or what's going on with the Dr. So Seuss yeah, I I love uh, Green Eggs and Ham as a book, and for three reasons. The first is that it is a uh, was written as a creative challenge. So there's only 50 words used in the entire book. They're yep. obviously repeated, but 50 word cap, which is like amazing when you think about it. Uh, I love that the message of the book is about not knowing what you're missing out until you try something new. And obviously like the lead character is like, I don't like green eggs and ham. And he tries it and he blows his mind. Like what an amazing uh, revelation to have. It's like, oh, if I try something, this, who knows what I'm missing out on. Uh, And thirdly, it's rhyming. And I love rhymes. Like I love puns and wordplay. And it's just like, with all of those limitations imposed on it, I think as a creative piece, it, it's just such a inspiration. Like I love everything it stands for, the, the constraints in which it was created. Uh, 
and it's just fun. Like we all need fun in our world. So yeah, I have a Dr. Seuss tattoo. And I would have I, more. I'd be covered in them if I could get away with it. But my daughter yeah. loves Dr. Seuss. I've probably read that book like at least a hundred times for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I've read it so many times. That's, I feel like, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like through your business through the last 13 years, we didn't even get to what you were doing before that. I don't know if we'll have time, but would you say that that's a philosophy? Try something new. Like, don't be afraid to make a mistake. That's, I feel like that's a, there's a thread of truth there in scaling a, a business, a video production totally. business. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's, you know, like I said before, I, I never set out to run a business or become a, an entrepreneur. Like it just sort of happened through, through luck and, and kind of failing forwards a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, like any, any, creative output like you need to risk stuff and you need to experiment and just see what what works and what feels right and and it sounds very sort of like a little bit of huru but it's it's sort of like i think if you don't experiment and test stuff out and fail then everything becomes really stale and safe and boring and so um as far as like our business methodology and approach, like we really champion challenging the brief. We really champion the wild creative idea. Um, and if we don't kind of throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks, I think we're not doing our job. There's so many other production companies and, and corporate video services that people can go to to get the safe clinical, I talk to camera, I do this, overlay, overlay, overlay nice lockup graphic at the end you're out whereas for us we can come in and go oh you want to promote you know whatever it is let's do a parody of Ozzy Osbourne and Sharon Osbourne on the couch and like we literally did that last week to announce a new pair of glasses for a company like it's just weird stuff we've done back to the future parodies we've done we did a speed parody where uh, this company had four leaders um, or department heads that were so notorious for going over time in their presentations so I was like why don't we get them to announce what it is and we'll put them on a bus with the threat of a bomb exploding if they don't get their messages out in time and they're like we love it amazing so we hire a minibus drive up and down the street in melbourne with them going presenting their message for what everybody needs to know and like the the content and the messaging doesn't change all that much but the, the wrapping around it is something new and interesting for us it's really exciting because it's it's fun and, and challenging there's so much that the, could go wrong exactly <laughs> that's but what the i'm client, thinking about the, the client also looks at it and goes right we're presenting this to an audience that are ready to sit down and listen to these four people bang on for hours about this stuff and we know we have to be here but we don't really care if you can present them something that kind of shakes up that expectation or really challenges what they were were thinking and presents it in a really fresh way what an amazing opportunity and then yeah. they go cool this worked really well can we do that again with something else and so the green eggs and ham idea is like, yeah, it's not going to work for every client. They're going to, you might pitch these ideas and they'll be like, yeah, it's a bit too unsafe. Let's come and rein it back in. But the ones that do love it, they just, they go ballistic. They, yeah. <laughs> so you're then in that ecosystem and that relationship where you develop so much trust and goodwill that, uh, you know, you then get to play in this really fun space that achieves what they need it to achieve, but also just facilitate some really fun and, and silly opportunities for what we get to do. So, yeah, I, I think like we could easily play it safe, but I think if we just constantly push that creative angle and challenge the brief and really try and create something unique or interesting, uh, it's much more satisfying for everybody involved. Speaking of creativity, have you used AI in anything yet? Have you used AI image generation, AI B-roll? Have you dabbled in that yet i'm just curious to know yeah uh we use it a little bit in in brainstorming so um a lot of like scripting or even like sort of key points or summarization stuff we use a lot of, of ai for that um and we've used some generative image stuff for proposals and pitch docs and things where you know we want to have a very specific look for something and, and trying to illustrate that we'll use it um i'm not the biggest fan of it. I think it's like, it's an amazing tool, but I think the way it's being really, I say abused, but like it's just being embraced a little bit too heavily by the kind of creative industry that I think it's going to 
do exactly what everything else is and just become this sort of, you know, really stagnant, stale, you know, snake eating its own tail thing of like the AI is generating mm. off AI responses and the whole thing just kind of feeds off itself. So, you know, I, I like it. I think it's a great tool, but I also think that the the benefit of of human interaction and human experience is going to be valued more um and i think that if you can use it as a stepping stone to then kind of give that human insight into something and sort of expedites that process a little bit great but i i definitely don't see a world in which it replaces a lot of what we what we do um i even tried like i do a lot of uh stuff on LinkedIn and, and that's kind of a big driver for a lot of cold conversations and um, networking for us. And even that, there's like a whole bunch of different software and solutions that kind of use AI to help write things that analyzes your profile yeah. and tries to generate stuff. And even then I'm like, what, what are we doing? Like, is that the point of this is to connect with people and, and kind of have yeah. a genuine conversation about how can we help you? Um, if you just stick a robot in front of me, it, like what, what happens there? Um, so yeah, I think it's interesting, but I'm definitely not like ready to just go. All right, everybody, you're fired. It's you're replaced by the robots. Like I think there's there's a way to go before that happens. Curious to know specific tools, like you said in your your pitch decks, maybe, or if you have storyboard tricks. Like I've tried a couple of different things and been very underwhelmed by yeah. the ability. Because I'm like, oh, I just need to mock up like. 12 boards or something like, and I, a couple of weeks ago, I tried to see what kind of tools were out there and I was like, oh, this is all very unimpressive. <laughs> mm. I still need my storyboard artist. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's nothing, you know, surprising. It's chat GPTs, the, the text prompt stuff and mid journey is, is our image generator. Oh, you're using stuff. mid journey. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard a few people with some really strong, uh, excitement around mid journey into runway to create like animatics basically so you okay. can then runway basically takes a still image and you can then prompt it to go you know it's a close-up panning around whatever um and it's it's still kind of got that weird shake quirk ai thing to it but for the most part it's they've had some success with it but yeah it's literally just chat gpt and mid journey now and for now right on okay we have a few minutes left i've got some rapid fires for you uh go. some rapid fire questions these are more like stereotypical Film nerd questions. Okay, favorite <laughs> right. lens focal length. Ooh, I love an eighty-five. Love an eighty-five. Ooh, good choice. Okay. Yeah. I, I already know this one. What's your go-to camera body right now? It's yeah, it's the FX uh, FS five. Yeah. Fixed but that said, lit. that said, I was going to say yeah. we we do shoot all of the uh, the YouTube video stuff on like these tiny little ZV E tens, I think the Sony's, and they're awesome. Like we're using Are them. They? Yeah, more on on some work stuff. It's like tiny little body, uh, autofocus, and you know, like throw them on a gimbal. You can just like it's great. They're awesome. So I'm definitely not like a gear snob. I'm not like you've got to have the high end stuff. It's like if it gets the job done, we use these little Insta 360 goes and stick them on hats and stuff. Those I'm are like, sweet. Those are sweet yeah. cameras. I yeah, love those. it's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, fixed lens or zoom? What's your preference? Ooh, I. If I'm being practical, I'd say a zoom lens purely from a like, you can just go, here's a camera, here's a lens, and you can get through most stuff. But if we're doing anything with a little bit more structure to it, whether there's a script, talent, whatever, it's prime lenses all the way. Okay. Describe mm -hmm. balloon tree in one word. Uh, fun. Manual focus or autofocus? Uh, I'm a big manual focus fan. I think okay. I've got trust issues with autofocus, but uh, I, I do like, you know, sometimes if you're shooting something and there's a little bit of missed focus and you're sort of catching it, like sometimes it's a nice little texture to it. So, yeah, I'm going to say manual focus. Yeah. Okay. Um, most challenging location you've ever shot in? <laughs> we were shooting at a netball court outside uh, and the day we had the shoot, there was a beer festival that had set up we had no idea about like literally 50 meters away and then uh, a world record attempt for most pancakes flipped at the same time on the other side of the netball court so you can imagine there's a stage there's music and stuff playing and then there's people going okay guys we're gonna throw the pancakes in three two one and like awful <laughs> Such that's a bad amazing day. what Such a, a good story day. 
Is yeah. there any behind the scenes footage from that? That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. that's so funny. Um <laughs> natural light or studio light? Ooh. I like natural light. I think if you can find a location uh, or utilize what's there already, I think it makes you move really fast if you can leverage that, but also just feels really, really authentic to what you're doing. Yeah. I think so often studio light, unless it's like a clear studio, you're trying to create, you know, real crazy contrast or mood or something. Um, if you're trying to light a scene to feel natural, why not just use the natural light? Cause that's what it looks like, you know? Yeah. 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 Agreed. Um, Ooh, this is a good one. What's your favorite scene in movie history? Favorite scene in movie history? I uh, I don't know if it's my favorite. It's the first one that came to mind. I love Back to the Future. It's my favorite movie of all time. And the thing I keep coming back to and just talking about all the time is the scene where Doc Brown like shows Marty the piece of paper he drew the flux capacitor on after he hit his head on the toilet. And he's so excited by this creation and the fact that like Marty's come back from the future and this thing he's drawn, like just this wild sketch has actually worked. And now this guy's in front of him, like to me kind of sums up the creative experience, right? It's quick, it's dirty, it's messy, but it's like, it's, it demonstrates to somebody, this thing works. Now let's put it into to practice. I kind of use that as a really strong metaphor through a lot of conversations about when we are you know, ideating or doing whatever. I kind of come back to that and just go like, Doc Brown invented time travel when he fell off the toilet, guys. So what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's the, the usual go-to for most people, but I think that's the one that kind of sprung to mind because, yeah, it's like a nice, nice reminder that creativity can be a bit dirty and mm -hmm. it's okay. Yeah. This is a good lead-in for one of the last ones. What's the best mistake you've ever made on set best mistake i've ever made on set mm -hmm. where you were like mm. actually that's awesome yeah you know what i mean you know what i mean if you can think of something it's i love asking this question but no one has successfully answered it yet interesting five episodes in it's a tough one but i'm like oh this is a good one someone's going to give me a good answer eventually i remember can I can I do a slight cop out and say a mistake I saw somebody else do that I learned okay. a lot from? Okay. So I remember. Um, I'm gonna be very careful that I don't name anybody in this, but I remember <laughs> um, uh, being on a shoot and there was it was one of those ones where we were a video team and there was a separate photography team there working with the same talent. And I remember the, it was outside. It was like a, a real estate-y lifestyle type thing. And the we were running out of time because the weather was pretty poor. And so we're getting you know spots of rain and stuff. So the schedule was getting really compressed. I remember the, the collaboration between the photographer and uh, the guy who was running our shoot was not very positive. It was very sort of tense and like, I need to get this. No, I need to get this. Uh, and at one point, the, the guy from our side, blew up at this photographer and the client was there and the talent, it was just like way off the deep end, real sort of dick swing and like, you know, I'm top mm -hmm. shit here, you get back in your place kind of thing. Yeah. I remember just like nobody said anything because it was kind of that like they had a really heated agreement or argument and then it just sort of went, all right, let's just get this done and move on. But I remember just you get that feeling in the air of like, oh, this is not going to, pan out well beyond today. It's like the, the fallout and repercussions of this blow up is going to sort of, you know, potentially ruin this, this relationship. And I just remember seeing that. And there's been a few moments like that um, through my career where I've seen like leaders or, or people that um, uh, are managing projects not do it well. And I've taken a lot from that into my own business and the way I work with people. I don't think that, you know, you should ever treat anybody with that level of disdain and, and, and aggression, um, because it's not helpful. And it's like, at what point was this going to make things any better? Like you might get what you want done, but it's never going to solve the bigger picture, which is we all need to get this thing done. And the client's going to be unhappy because one thing's going to be compromised of the other. Um, and I, yeah, there's a few moments like that, that I just remember going, you know what, that's not the way I want to lead. That's not the way I want to run a business or have any interactions with people. Uh, so it is kind of a cop out answer. It's not my mistake, but definitely one that I remember really, really strongly. There, there's wisdom in it, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like you're going to have a good answer to this. Uh, what's <laughs> no your pressure. favorite guilty pleasure film? Guilty pleasure film. Yeah. Oh. Or what you would consider is a guilty pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
True Lies. Okay. Why yeah. guilty pleasure? Interesting. I don't know. I think it's just, it. I don't know. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I don't know if it's aged all that well. Like it feels like a real, real nineties movie. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It just feels like there's so much out. Like I'm really bad at, and you understand this with kids and running a business. Like I'm so bad at watching anything. Oh my gosh. As it comes out. Right. And so Mm -hmm. I, I will, if I have the time to myself and I can, I'm going to sit down and watch a movie. It feels, I feel guilty going back to true lies than watching, you know, (laughs) I totally understand succession or whatever. Right. So I think, I think that I also adore dodgeball, the Ben Stiller, Vince Vaughn movie from back in the day. Just so dumb. So dumb. <laughs> Extremely dumb. Vince yeah. Vaughn is a, is a legend, though. He's so incredible. And and this uh, to my point, right? Like, he's in this new show that's come out, and I'm like, that looks great. Can't wait to never watch it because I don't have any time to commit to a 10-episode season of something. But, yeah, Dodgeball's awesome. Okay. Well, that's about time for us. Uh, this has been an awesome chat. Um, I want to ask you one more thing. Because I watched your Jeep YouTube, which, by the way, those listening, you need to go check out Matt's YouTube channel. I'll link it below wherever this is posted. Um, is it true? My wife will not. I re- Australia is one of the few places that I still have not been able had an excuse to go to. When my wife was like, "We can't yeah. go there. There's spiders the size of <laughs> dogs there." And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, Google it. You'll see there's giant spiders. And I watched your deep video and I was like, okay, maybe maybe spiders are like a big thing in Australia. So is it true? Are there actually oh, yeah. like, like walking Sp- down the street, you'll see a spider the size of a dog, like a small yeah, dog. Yeah, maybe not a small dog, but they're definitely, there's huntsmen's, which are the big ones and they're completely harmless. Like they will not, you know, if you get bit, they, in fact, they won't bite you, but even if they did, they're not venomous or anything, but they're, you know, like- Pretty Ooh. big. Yeah. And they're just usually, like I like I said, I grew up in the country, so we had them all the time. And they just, you'd wake up in the morning, there'd be like a big huntsman in the corner of the room and then another one there and just like- Holy they're shit. They're everywhere. Yeah. They're that everywhere. would take me a while. To, I, I have only been a, I live in Florida and I've only been a resident here for three years, but I am now used to the cockroaches, the palmetto bugs right. uh, here. Yeah, yeah. You got those in Australia, right? There's yeah, yeah, but it's it's not as big a deal. It's like it's so it's, tropical down here. It's like a jungle, and for some reason they love it, and they get big, man. And it was yeah. a, a while for me to get used to it. I was like, "Whew, okay." Well, yeah. I'm so I don't. I'm not coming back to my wife with good news. I'm going to tell her <laughs> yes. The spiders are huge there, but like they're all harmless. It's fine. It's fine. I feel like it's less scary because they're bigger. I feel like what makes a spider scary is that they're like quick and small and hard to grab. Like if they're yeah. big, maybe it removes some fear. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the drop bears you got to worry about. What is that? <laughs> just Google it. I'm not going to tell you. Just Google drop bears Australia. You'll you'll find oh out. Oh my god. Okay. Before I get into bed, because I'm going to go to bed after this, I'm going to Google it and try to then. What try I, to fall what I love about this, Jacob, is that all of the Australians that are going to listen to this are going to be like, oh yeah, the drop bears, and everybody else going, what the, what the heck's a drop bear? And I'm mm-hmm. I'm hoping that Google Trends shows this big spike in uh, Google searches <laughs> for drop bears. Do so you need to Dro- know. spell that? Spell drop like bears. Drop bears. Yeah. Like D R O P. Like the B-E. animal bear. Yeah, drop bear. So there's a spider named after a bear. Oh my god! No, it's, it's not a it's not a spider at all. It's a bear that drops out of trees. What? Yeah. See, Australia Just is on. <laughs> you guys are on another level with animals. Like you're on another level. I, yeah. People. Anyway, all right, we could ramble on for hours. Thank you so much for your time. We just went one minute over. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. I'm. I've got like three more of these to go, and then season one is is dropping all at once. So oh, I'll I'll reach out when we're when we're live. Mm-hmm.